Well, welcome to In Dialogue, Smithsonian Objects and Social Justice, a collaborative program hosted by educators from the National Portrait Gallery and this month, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. My name is Jocelyn Coe. I am an educator at the National Portrait Gallery and I'm joined this evening by my wonderful colleagues who um, I will have them introduce themselves. Carol, if you could go first, please. Sure, hi everyone. I'm Carol Wilson. I'm the Lunder Education Chair at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Uh, I know you're all joining us today from varied locations, so you may not know that the American Art Museum shares a beautiful 19th century building with the National Portrait Gallery. So we're literally neighbors, uh, or maybe roommates is a better way to say it, mm -hmm. um, but our collections really complement each other so well, and I'm pleased to be here tonight to be in dialogue with my NPG colleagues, so thanks for inviting me. Hi everyone, my name is Brianna White um, and I'm the head of education for the Portrait Gallery um, and I work with Jocelyn and I've worked with Carol for a number of years um, and I will be monitoring the chat so you'll hear me popping in and out um, relaying all of your wonderful comments to Jocelyn and Carol. And we should have Ashley joining us as well. Um, Ashley is busy um, doing the uh, slideshow and um, putting links in. So Ashley is also one of our um, wonderful colleagues who will be on the program as well. So it is our intention with this program to explore civic awareness through conversations about art, history and material culture, and to discuss how historical and contemporary objects from our collections speak to today's social justice issues. Now, this program will be recorded. So if you turn your camera or microphone on, the audio or video feed from your device might be captured and used for Smithsonian purposes in the future. So please take care um, to um, keep from view anything you do not want to share. Now, we will be asking you to engage with us and with each other by using the chat box during the program this evening. Also, real-time captioning will be provided for this program to turn the captions on or off you can toggle over the CC or the closed caption button on your Zoom window at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Brianna. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, we'd like to begin our program this evening um, with a land acknowledgement. Although we're getting together today from different places, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. We also recognize that since the nation's founding, who is represented and how one is represented reflects the country's flaws as well as its strengths. The National Portrait Gallery strives to present a more complete narrative, one that acknowledges the history of slavery, racism, and inequality in the United States. Let's also take this time to briefly acknowledge the continued impact of racism on people of color through systems of oppression and racial violence, including police brutality, public acts of xenophobia and anti-Asian racism. Now, we've been doing this program um, for almost a year now. Um, and one of the ways that we always begin um, this program is to talk about um, community norms. Um, for this group over the course of the hour. And so you see the community norms on the, um, on the slide deck, but I'm just gonna run through them very quickly. Um, we are of course respecting others and their opinions. We're considering our own privacy and that of others. Um, we're avoiding uh, inappropriate material and statements. Um, and in addition to that, of course, cyberbullying will not be tolerated. Um, we are here um, in this program, we're present, we're patient, um, we're compassionate, 
Um, and together we're creating a safe space. Um, we all come to this different this conversation with different lived experiences, perspectives, and ideas. And even in disagreement, we can learn from each other and build community. Um, and I might also just remind everybody um, at this point um, to go ahead and mute your microphone. Um, and as Jocelyn has already said, we'll be engaging um, in the chat over the course of this program. All right, I guess um, it's over to me then. Thanks, Brianna. Um, so let's jump right in and to the first piece that we're gonna look at tonight. Ashley, could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so as, all, as you all were joining us tonight to get us warmed up, we asked you to describe the image from this photograph in three words. Um, and I think that deep looking is a helpful way to process visual content and pairing our observations, what we see with words, what we think about what we see, um, can really help us make sense of an image and begin to form questions and try to glean answers using visual evidence. Um, I know there's been a lot of activity in the coming into the chat. Um, so let's take a look some, at some of those observations now. Um, Brianna, what do you see in the chat? Can you share some of the words with us that folks have been uh, putting in there? Yeah, there are, um, there are a whole slew of words. Um, we have everything from young, bright, hardworking to confused, stunned, unsure. Um, I'm seeing words like um, tentative, um, apprehensive, um, vulnerable, um, and I'm just looking um, through. Um, there is also a, a formality um, here um, in that it's a black and white photograph. Um, and I'm also seeing official, young, strong, um, and somebody mentioned that perhaps it looks like a mugshot, um, as well as innocent, sad. So a wide, um, a wide range of um, of descriptive words, Carol, when looking at this photograph. Fantastic. I love it. Some people giving sort of three separate words, some people putting putting words together to make like a three word story almost. Um, and hearing those words like bright and young, confused, stunned, you know, there's some dichotomies there about what people are thinking, but you're all really picking up on so many aspects of this photograph already. Um, you may be observing the subject, um, it appears to be a woman. Uh, you're thinking about her ethnicity, thinking about her state of mind. Um, is she confused? Is she stunned, tentative, apprehensive, vulnerable? Um, thinking about what she's wearing, you know, looking at her clothing, her physical appearance. Um, you're, you're also noticing some of the physical aspects of the photo itself, right? Um, the sort of formality of it, someone mentioned. Um, it's black and white, um, possibly cropped. Noticing her face sort of fills the whole frame here in this image. Um, she's framed against a solid background, noticing how she's posed, um, looking out at us directly in a fully frontal point of view. Um, and you may also be starting to touch upon um, and even be curious about, you know, what's going on here? Some folks mentioned, um, is it, this looks official. Um, so that's really an interesting word to describe that. Is it a mugshot, someone said. Um, so we're starting to wonder about who this person is. Um, what's the intent of this photo? Who took it? Uh, when was it made? And for what purpose? How large is it? You know, some of those, all of those things. So all of these deeper questions are fantastic. And, and, and let's hold on to these observations because they'll lead us directly into our essential question for this session. Um, Ashley, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, tonight, we're going to invite you to consider how can portraits reveal complex histories? And when we think about complex histories, we're going to think about stories, about individual stories of identity, uh, both internal and external, and about the idea of representation. Um, and in thinking about this portrait that we've been looking at, we've been making assumptions about the sitter and we've asked questions. We've looked at her from an external contemporary lens, uh, but how can we understand a fuller story about who this person is uh, and the context of that? So we might think about 
who has or had control in the making of this image? Uh, did the sitter have a sense of agency in the way that she's being represented here? Um, what new information do we need to examine this image in a fuller context and to reveal more of the personal history of both the sitter and the historical period in which it was made? Um, I think what's revealed by an image and sometimes what is concealed are both aspects of that. The story of this particular image is contained as much in what we see here uh, as, as in what we don't see. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jocelyn to give us uh, more to see here and more to consider as we build a larger story around this image. So Jocelyn, over to you. Thank you, Carol. And uh, yes, definitely a lot to see based on um, what perhaps we initially do not see. So um, I wanted us to actually take a look at this image within the context of the whole portrait that it is a part of. And Ashley, if I could have you move on to the next slide, please. So we have here the entire portrait. Um, and if you could, in the chat box, put in additional observations that you have about this portrait now that you're viewing it in its entirety. Um, any words or impressions or even colors that you're seeing, um, go ahead and put that in. I will provide um, a nugget of information. Our sitter here is Ruth Asawa. She was born in 1926 in Norwalk, California, which um, is a rural area um, now part of LA County. Um, her parents were immigrants from Japan and resided in California. Now her parents were unable to be US citizens or own any property um, due to the alien land law of 1913. So with that bit of information, Brianna, what, um, what responses are we getting um, as people are observing the entire portrait? Well, we're seeing um, words like possibilities, hopefulness, um, dignity. Um, so more of those um, descriptive words. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm also seeing uh, the greenness of the card, uh, which is contrasted um, with the black and white um, of the photograph. Um, and then uh, some, of, um, some of the people participating are starting to add more information um, about, um, uh, about uh, Japanese incarceration camps um, during World War II. Um, this idea that it almost, the card looks like printed currency. It's that green that we know uh, so well um, on right. money. Um, uh, and there is, uh, and there is a reference to the number, the bright red number that we see uh, in the lower left-hand corner. Okay. Yeah. And uh, again, another reference to thinking that this was some form of government issued um, documentation. And then we are also starting to see questions. Um, did yeah. the individual represented become an artist? Um, ah, okay. Like I'll turn right. it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Brianna. Wow, lots of definitely, definitely um, uh, good observations and details that have been pulled out. Um, now, I actually want to, um, before we move on any further, I heard words and I, I see words like relocation and internment. And what we're seeing here is Ruth Asawa's, you'll see, United States War Relocation Authority Citizens Indefinite Leave Card. <laughs> That's quite a mouthful. Um, and before we move any further, um, we do want to address some terminology that will be used during the program. Now, how we interpret history is often fluid and it changes over time, as are the words that are used to tell or retell that history. Now, in regard to research we've done in preparation for the upcoming dialogue surrounding portraits of Japanese Americans during World War II, scholars and community members have argued that terms such as internment, 
relocation center, evacuation have been used as euphemisms and neutralize the injustice and trauma caused by the US government. To acknowledge that critique and for purposes for our session this evening, we will reference and include terms such as incarceration, incarcery, American concentration camps. Now a note on the term concentration camp, we do recognize its association with the Holocaust and the horrendous atrocities Nazi Germany carried out. And in no way are we comparing the two. But by using the term American concentration camp, which the federal government and President Franklin Roosevelt initially referred to them at the time, we are expressing the gravity of what was done to Japanese Americans. Now, if you would like to explore further or learn more, Ashley's going to be adding a few links to the chat box. Um, and so I do wanna turn back to the portrait and um, Brianna, were there some more things that came in as we're looking at the portrait, seeing that it is like currency and the red numbers? Um, anything else? Yeah, I, I definitely want to um, I want to call out what Catherine is saying um, about this idea of contradictions. Um, one that she um, that this that this document says that she is a citizen, but it is also allowing her to leave a specific area. Um, and so it's a big question mark. Why does a citizen need permission um, and that she is um, that she is a citizen? I um, mean, I think hearing a little bit more um, about what you've had to say about this ID card um, is definitely resonating um, with our participants about some of their earlier observations um, that they had about what they saw. Great. Thank you. And yes, thank you, Catherine. Um, that is very much a, a good point. It is a contradiction. Um, and so this card was issued to Ruth Asawa. Um, as I mentioned, she was an American citizen, but when um, Executive Order 9066 legalized the imprisonment of Japanese Americans in 1942, Ruth and her family, um, well, Ruth, her mother, and all but six of her siblings um, were incarcerated first at the Santa Anita racetrack in Arcadia, California, where they were, were um, staying in these converted horse stalls. Um, their father had been um, separated from them and taken to a different um, American concentration camp. Now, just to give you a sense also, she is um, 17 years old uh, when this portrait was made. Um, you can see how it's well-worn. Um, during this time, she um, actually, is not passively accepting um, her father's separation. So as a 17 year old, she's on a letter writing campaign, even though she's in the um, camps, she is trying to um, get her father reunited with their family. Um, she writes to every US official in the Department of Justice and the US Attorney's Office um, that she knows um, to be involved with her father's case. Also during this time, she is completing her high school career in the camp. And graduates of the camp were, even though they were US citizens, um, granted the ability to leave the camps on two conditions. Um, they needed to find a sponsor and they had to be able to attend a university in the interior of the United States. Um, they were forbidden to return to their homes in California, to the West Coast, and due to um, supposedly military necessity at the time. Um, so you can see uh, the card is well-worn. Um, she needed to have it on hand all the time um, for fear of being suspicious or um, uh, not accounted for. 
Um, and so she, she does end up going. Um, unfortunately, she is unable to complete her uh, degree in um, to be a teacher because due to discrimination and racism, she's unable to secure a student placement position. Um, so she cannot complete her degree. Instead, she makes her way to Black Mountain College and it is there where her journey as um, an incredible artist, um, this avid um, sculptor, gifted sculptor and um, advocate for arts education really formalizes. Um, so I think someone had asked if she was an artist and yes, she was this uh, really incredible sculptor. Well, with that, um, we have been able to unpack some um, uh, things about this portrait. And Ashley, if we could move on to the next portrait, please. Gonna look at this one and um, with a lens of um, stepping into this portrait. If you could take a look at the portrait and um, put in the chat box what you think the sitter might be feeling. Take in um, what you're seeing and um, let us know how you think the sitter is feeling. And as you're doing that, I will just let you know, we have the artist Hung Lu who created this portrait. She is Chinese born American artist and um, the, she is known for sourcing historic photographs and creating these incredible colorful murals. Um, the National Portrait Gallery has an exhibition of her work um, and uh, I am thrilled. She is actually the first woman of Asian descent to have a solo retrospective at the National Portrait Gallery. So Brianna, what are some things that you're um, seeing in the chat box? Um, I am thoroughly enjoying the chat box right now. Um, I'm seeing everything from stoic and resigned to determined um, to pl proud plus reserved. Um, there is uh, an, an inner strength that we see, um, but then there's also this idea that it looks like um, she is scrutinized. Um, uh, somebody is commenting, Andrea is commenting um, that it says alien, but she is a human. She is a woman. She is not um, an alien. Um, and she is staring down the eagle who looks at her. <laughs> and then there are starting to be questions that are coming in um, about uh, the name on the card of Fortune Cookie. Um, and again, with the contra contradictions um, that one, um, she's a resident, but two, um, there's this idea of being um, an alien, like a space person. Yes. All right, thank you. And definitely there is that contradiction. Um, we are seeing, um, this is a green card um, for supposedly the holder is fortune cookie. Um, and Hung Lu um, intentionally puts, um, has this identity um, perhaps for, for two reasons. Um, the fortune cookie is actually an American invention. Um, it was first served in San Francisco. Um, and then in regards to fortune cookie, um, in some circles, it's considered a slang for a woman of Asian descent. So we get that twofold um, kind of meaning behind um, our sitter. Um, and yes, there's also that tension with resident alien. Now, Hung Lu um, was uh, born in Changchun, China and um, she experienced the Cultural Revolution um, and experienced displacement, um, hardship, um, loss. And um, she actually worked in um, the, the countryside um, and she somehow made it to the United States. And um, she arrived in 1984, so you'll see that on the card. 
Um, and like all um, many immigrants, they have their dictionary on hand and Hung Lu had hers as well. And she looked up the word alien and I think was um, offended to think that as an immigrant, uh, she was considered an alien too. And the word itself has deep roots. Um, and uh, certainly this, this green card is uh, relevant even today with um, issues of immigration and how um, the word itself is actually trying to be uh, replaced um, in regards to immigration agencies. So yes, we're, we're seeing a lot in this, um, in this portrait of um, Hung Lu as fortune cookie. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Carol for our next part. Oh, you're on mute, Carol. Whoops, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, thank you, uh, Jocelyn, really rich conversation there. And I love these ideas that are coming out. Um, now I'm gonna take a look at these two images together that we've, we've been seeing. Um, so feel free to drop any of your observations in the chat as we're talking. What new thoughts come to mind when we look at these two pieces in conversation with each other? Um, I'm looking at them together and I'm struck by the similarities. They're both related to official documentation, um, official government documentation specifically. Um, and I'm thinking about the distinction between a document and a work of art. Um, you know, how can a work of art, a photograph or a painting in this case, document identity? Um, the Ruth Asawa piece is literally a government issued, you know, document as we've talked about. Um, something that she was required to carry to, to quote, prove her identity in a way that the government has defined it. And Hung Lu is questioning that idea of sort of proving one's identity, I think, by taking some creative license um, with an actual government document and altering it. Um, she's playing with the image instead of a frontal head-on portrait as in uh, Ruth Asawa's uh, image. Um, she's here created a portrait on the left side of her painting uh, with her face in sort of a three-quarter turn rather than head-on. Um, she's playing with the words, um, as, as Jocelyn noted, some of the words that we see on here, the name and the title, um, and, and changing the meaning of what that is. And she's also playing with scale. Um, can we go to the next slide, um, Ashley? Here you can see just how large the actual resident alien painting is. We see the artist herself, uh, Hung Lu, sitting in front of the painting in 1988. And Hung Lu once said that she saw her green card as a billboard, almost an advertising, as if she was, quote, proclaiming my status aloud for all to see. Um, and indeed, she's created a large, almost billboard sized painting here. Um, so to me, it's almost as if she's reclaiming her identity, even creating a whole new identity with a new name, uh, fortune cookie, and, and, and really, but taking back that name and taking control over it and asserting control over her, her own image too, and the way that it's portrayed. I actually kind of see this portrait as three portraits of the artist. As I was looking at it, it occurred to me that on the left, we have her physical likeness um, of her face which is of course much larger than her, you know, than life size. And on the right, we see her fingerprint, um, which is also sort of a unique picture of her, uh, literally an impression of her that's not the same as anyone else. Um, and then in the middle, we see this identifying information overlaid onto um, the immigration uh, and naturalization service seal. I'm not sure if you can, you know, read all of those numbers and everything uh, that it says, but this information is, it, it, it sort of tells us where she entered the country um, and when and for what purpose, um, you know, she, they're documenting her as a CR6 status, um, which is related to a conditional status for entering the country um, based on your standing through marriage. Um, and, you know, and they've actually assigned her, you know, an alien number, which is another, you know, government identified identifier or unique identifier. So um, the, the government is, again, identifying her with this, this number. It, it really occurred to me that we sort of have these three different portraits or three different ways to signify who she is, her unique uh, visual 
uh, physical fingerprint and then the bureaucratic portrait, if you will. So um, three different ways here. Um, Brianna, is there anything in the chat that folks are thinking that you'd like to, to add or highlight as we look at these two together? Sure. Um, a couple of uh, responses really stood out to me. Um, this idea that even though these two portraits um, are created years apart, we're still seeing um, discrimination and prejudice uh, present in both images. <clears throat> and then yet another comment um, where resident alien portrait, uh, you know, the way that Hong Lu has represented herself, she um, seems more defiant, whereas the government document, the ID card, it feels um, a bit more oppressive. And then their ideas, right, about Hung Lu um, asserting control um, over her own likeness um, and portraying herself um, in this way. Um, and then um, there was a comment uh, somewhere along the way about um, uh, the fact that on the um, on the ID card of Ruth Asawa that the portrait gallery notes the artist as an identified artist. Mm -hmm. um, and while we certainly don't think about um, an artist creating the ID card, um, we don't know exactly who created it. And it, that is, it's just terminology, um, as you know, Carol, that museums used when we don't know who created something. Right, yeah, this, that's a fascinating observation though. It goes back to the idea of like a, the difference between a government, uh, a document and a work of art, you know, what's what's the purpose of that, of creating this object there? Um, absolutely. Um, great, okay, thank you for all of those observations. Um, what I think we're gonna do now is introduce a new work of art into the mix. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, take a minute to just really look at this painting um and see if you can uh just really kind of waterfall drop into the chat some words really quickly all at once um just what are you seeing here what objects um uh, people what colors textures lines uh spaces uh anything else that you observe in the painting and while you're doing that, just to give you a since we were talking about scale um, earlier, to give you a sense of the scale of this piece in real life uh, or in our galleries, I should say, it's it's brightly colored. Um, it's more, I would say, more square than rectangular, and it's a little over four feet high and about five feet wide. Uh, so it's pretty large. It's not quite as large as the Hang Lu, uh, but definitely larger than the Ruth Asawa ID card. Um, and it has a pretty striking presence when you see it in person. I'm not sure if that comes across on the screen um, in terms of the colors, but I um, wanted to just give you a little more sense of the physical presence of the piece. Um, so Brianna, what are you seeing in the chat for descriptive words um, that people are noticing here? Um, when you said waterfall, the waterfall that came through was, um, we had multiple people say dreaming of Superman. Ah, um, okay. <laughs> Uh, there are um, there are words like um, uh, geometric um, transformation. Um, a lot of um, a lot of people are noticing um, shadows um, okay. and shading. Um, also, shadowy figures. Um, this idea of heroes, superheroes, capes. Um, so, thinking about um, heroism. Um, and um, this idea of um, perhaps gender assigned roles. Um, yeah, all, all sorts of really wonderful um, comments coming in. I love it, I love it. Yeah. Um, I love, so, so, so let's dig into some of those comments. Um, really talking first of all, just about the geometry and the sort of physical aspects of this piece. Um, you're seeing a lot of lines, a lot of verticals, a lot of horizontals, a lot of lines that are kind of leading your eye around the painting. Um, and you're seeing both bright colors, you know, sort of the vivid patterns that we see inside the room, the, the orange and white sort of zigzag patterns, 
um, the brightly colored um, clothing and kimono that the woman is wearing, um, the yellow floor, the purple and the, the green outside. But that's contrasted with some of these shadows that y'all are mentioning, this sort of gray, um, more, more grayed out presence, perhaps. Um, and we see the shadows in sort of two different um, areas. One is on the left where we see um, it's, it's as if the viewer, as we are outside of this room and we see this screen coming down on the left in this very geometric grid pattern. And through that, we see the shadow of the woman who's inside the room, but from outside, it looks sort of grayed out to, to use somebody's words, which I find really interesting as if, um, as if, you know, if you were external to, to this room, you would just see the person inside in a very one dimension, just sort of a grayed out silhouette of who they really are. And it's not until we get a look inside the room that we really see these beautiful colors and these this deeper description of who's in there. Um, but we also, if we take the point of view of the person in the room and we're looking out Side the room through the window on the left or the screen on the left, you see another shadow figure. So um, this person seems to have a really muscular frame. Uh, many are reading it as masculine figure posed with um, hands on hips and legs spread wide in this powerful stance um, and noticing what looks like a cape almost appearing, billowing out behind the figure. Um, some folks reminding, saying it may remind them of a superhero. Um, and in particular, y'all have, uh, many people have mentioned Superman. That idea, someone has said, dreaming of Superman, I, you know, is the woman dreaming? Is this a dream figure that she's seeing outside the window, potentially? Um, and words that, you know, coming to mind is seeing in here strong, heroic. Um, protective is an interesting word. Is the figure, you know, noticing that taking this sort of protective stance, um, is the figure being protective? Or is it more of a dominant figure who's, you know, is, is someone who's protecting her from the outside or someone who's keeping her in? Um, it's an interesting, you know, way to think about it. Um, and then we're looking at the woman herself, seeing her features, her hair, uh, the beautiful kimono she's wearing, which suggests her Japanese heritage. She's resting her chin on her right hand. And she's gazing out the, the doorway ahead of her, almost uh, towards the space where we as the viewer are. Um, she's looking sort of pensively. Um, and the screen, you know, the screen walls again around her that are contributing these shadows are in a traditionally Japanese architectural design element here. Um, and in front of her, we see her sitting uh, with her elbows setting on this, this uh, bench or desk. And there appears to be a writing set on, on the desk, um, a, a box, so to speak, with um, some pen and ink in it um, and brushes. And we see a book and some paper on the table in front of her. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the context of this painting. Um, uh, um, Ashley, if you can um, reveal the title of the painting here for us, I think uh, we have a little, we, we should have it there perhaps on the next slide. Um, this painting is called Diary, December 12, 1941. And it's a painting made by Roger Shimomura in 1980, so 40 years after uh, the, the image in which is depicted. And the painting depicts Roger's grandmother, Toku Shimomura. That's who we see in the painting. Um, and, and just to talk a little bit about the significance of the date in the title of the painting, December 12, 1941 was five days after the Japanese attack on the U.S. naval base of Pearl Harbor and four days after the United States formal declaration of war against Japan. Um, and we know that in February of 1942, as we've talked about, um, President Roosevelt signed the executive order for people of Japanese ancestry living in the West Coast, even those who were citizens, to be forcibly relocated and incarcerated in camps. So Toku depicted here, um, along with her family, including her then, I think, two or three-year-old grandson, uh, Roger Shimomura, who made this painting, um, they were transferred in August of 1942 to what was called the Minidoka Relocation Center, which was, as we've said, an incarceration camp um, near Hagerman, Idaho. And that's where they lived for the duration of the war. So the date of the painting's title, December 12, um, it also refers to the date of a diary entry written by the artist's grandmother, by Toku, whom we see here. 
So following the December 41, uh, December 7th, 41 uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, the federal government froze the bank accounts of Japanese Americans. And since they were seen as posing a, a potential national security threat, um, but a few days later, on December 12th, um, on the day of, this, the, of the title of this painting, the government permitted Japanese Americans to withdraw small amounts of money up to $100 um, for living expenses from the bank. So on December 12th, Toku wrote in her diary, which we see sitting here on the bench, um, uh, she wrote, and this is translated from, from Japanese, I spent all day at home. Starting from today, we were permitted to withdraw $100 from the bank. This was for our sustenance of life, we who are enemy to them. I deeply felt America's large heartedness in dealing with us. So there's a lot to <laughs> unpack there in that statement, I think. Um, and you know, feel free to write in the chat um, what you're thinking about that quote and what uh, Toku might have been feeling when she wrote that. Um, it's, it's so interesting to me when thinking about um, using words like America's large heartedness in dealing with us. Um, and and I'm, I've always been struck by that because I'm thinking about this, this diary that she's writing. It's a personal diary. You know, diaries are generally meant to be, you know, personal reflections for no one else to see. Um, but, but, you know, knowing that um, this diary could be confiscated and could be read and could, you know, um, if she says anything that's inflammatory, you know, not sure, um, could put herself or her family in danger. Um, but really interesting to relate that, that statement that she's writing to the visual imagery in the painting and back to this look at the shadow figure in the back who, um, again, is have this sort of heroic and sort of superhero stance. Um, going back to that idea of, you know, is it a protective stance? Is it a protective figure? And who is it supposed to be? Is it supposed to be a stand-in for um, an American soldier? Is it supposed to be a stand-in for the American government? Um, you know, just curious to see uh, if folks have any thoughts on, on any of that um, as things are coming in. Brianna, do you notice anything in the chat um, that might speak to that? Um, there have been some comments about um, the, the 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 sort of bright colors within the space um, that um, Toku is in, and sort of the um, more shadows outside. And that is, and the more um, the more that you've talked, the more we're starting to see this idea of the bright the bright colors contrasting with really such a grim um, a grim subject, um, and the fact that the quote clarifies the ambiguity in the image. Um, but now um, perhaps there is a, a, a sense of irony here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea of protecting um, as well as um, imprisoning um, and hoping that America lives to its ideals versus mm -hmm. being viewed as um, versus being viewed as the enemy. That's yeah, fascinating. Absolutely. Uh, I love that. I love that observation. And thinking about just the way that it's depicted, um, you know, Shimamura's painting style really recalls the um, ukiyo-e Japanese wood, woodblock paintings uh, and prints from the Edo period during the 17th and to 19th centuries. And probably this was the style that most heavily shaped the West's perception of Japanese art. Um, since that type of art was more prevalent um, in the West. So it's interesting that Shimomura tended to use almost make harken back to that style in this painting because he's almost making a comment on sort of the West's perception of Japan and of the Japanese people and who they are, seeing it um, from that um, uh, from that point of view. Um, also, we do know that domestic scenes of women were one of the most popular subjects in these prints uh, traditionally. So he's taking again that that um, taking off of that traditional idea and and bringing it into uh, both a contemporary context in the 1940s um, in which this this event occurred, but he's also um, bringing it into a more contemporary context in the 1980s when uh, the piece was made. Um, you can see that it almost has a little bit of a pop art sensibility to it also. And, and that's interesting, but Shimomura was um, heavily influenced by, um, by comics in the 1960s. Um, and they're actually, um, uh, if you, you can go back and find 
uh, common, uh, comic books of the period, even during the 40s, um, when um, during, the, during the war, American comic books um, very much equated the imagery of American soldiers and this heroic imagery with these sort of superhero characters, with Superman in particular. Um, and you can see these direct references um, to the comics of the time that Shimamore is using and pulling out those references and inserting them into the, into the painting here. Um, as his work developed, he's really, you know, all of his style has, has kind of taken these cues from, you know, historical and traditional images, but also from pop, pop cultural references and comic books. All of those things have informed um, his work, and I think you see all of those here um, in this painting for sure. Um, Let's see, anything else? Someone, someone's saying Lichtenstein, -y. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, referring to, um, you know, the artist, Lich you know, Lichtenstein, who's you making pop art images also, um, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, making it, making an interesting point, uh, connecting this to the Ruth Asawa ID photo um, and how to maintain that sort of composure in the face of atrocity um, in thinking of what's being written in her diary um, and what that might mean. Uh, and, as, and opposed to what is really felt internally. Um, I'm struck by this painting as sort of the internal and external aspects of it as well, in terms of where we are as the viewer, we see the outside of this room and the screen, and it's almost like we're an outsider looking into this very warm interior. Yet from outside, it's as if um, the figure is being painted with one brush almost in this very shadowy, monochromatic gray uh, shadow. And it, it, to me, it almost seems resonant of the way that, you know, the government painted all um, people of Japanese descent or Japanese Americans at that time with one brush, you know, considering them an enemy of, of the country, you know, whether they were citizens or not, um, whether they, you know, pledged allegiance or whether they um, even fought for this country. Um, you know, in the war. So, you know, interesting to see kind of that play on um, internal versus external identity, how you're seen externally versus, you know, um, how you may um, depict yourself. And those aspects of, of, of representation, I think, is really interesting to think when we start to compare all three of these objects um, together. So maybe on that note, we'll go to the next slide if we can. Um, um, Ash. Oh, I forgot about this one. Yeah. <laughs> Great. This is actually, I just wanted to show you real quick. This is uh, an image actually of the actual, uh, Shimomura had the actual uh, ink box of his grandmother's. And that's actually what he was depicting in, in the painting. Um, you see the box that has the lip around it, the, the light colored edge, and it has even a cover in the photograph on the right. And you see her brushes and the ink uh, and the paper that, that it was included uh, wherein. So he actually has uh, this and he actually has her diaries as well um, and you know translating was able to translate those um, and looking at uh, making a series of work based on the contents within. So if we go to the next slide and we actually look at these three um, images together um, I think it's a nice way to kind of bring this all home and think again about um, our essential question of how uh, portraits can reveal complex histories and complex images. Um, when we think about the idea of national identity and belonging, um, think, of, think of that in terms of these three images in conversation um, with each other. Um, do they belong? And based on whose perspective here? Um, for the Ruth Asawa piece back there on the bottom left, again, uh, revisiting that, there's a quote I read in a recent American Art Journal article about Ruth Asawa, uh, that speak to this idea of nationalized identity in which Ruth Asawa said about herself, quote, I don't think of myself as Japanese. I think of myself as somebody with an idea, a human idea rather than an ethnic idea. Um, and this brings up that idea of internal identity versus external identity or identities, plural, uh, that are placed on us by others and how we think about ourselves versus how others may think about us. Um, I find it interesting to think about this image of Asawa through that lens, you know, um, what do we see when we look at her, at her image? Think back to the descriptive words we came up with in the beginning, right, in our, in our warm-up activity. Um, we heard folks say, you know, I see a woman, someone who's Japanese. Um, did they say someone who's American? Um, you know, interesting to think. And um, Asawa also said... 
um, this attitude has forced me to become a citizen of the universe by which I become infinitely smaller than if I belong to a family or of a province or race. Then I can allow myself to pass and not to be hurt as mortally by ugly remarks because I no longer identify myself as Japanese or American. So this idea of identifying as part of a larger universal or human race seems almost a protective stance uh, in her way of thinking, or perhaps a proactive stance um, in, in, in sort of, you know, uh, anticipating hurtful assumptions about her because of the way she identifies herself is broader than the box you seek to put me in, uh, and, and making me think of the box that um, Shimomura's grandmother is in in the painting on the right. right. I'm also not Oh, oh, yeah, please jump in. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say um, there's definitely a spectrum with that, um, with um, Ruth Asawa and um, that sense. It, it was almost like a coping skill for her yeah. um, to not identify as Japanese or American. Um, but in regards to um, uh, Hung Lu, um, we, we get the spectrum. Um, she, in fact, um, saw herself as a citizen of the world. Um, she spent half her life in China, half her life in the US. And um, to her, she viewed herself um, as a global citizen. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you were talking about with um, Shimomura, um, he sees himself as an American, but he perceive, he sees others um, viewing him as a foreigner. Um, mm -hmm. They view him as a perpetual foreigner, but he sees himself as an American. Um, so we do, we get that spectrum from citizen of the universe all the way to an American citizen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a large part of um, Shimomura's artistic practice reflects those experiences with that feeling, um, as you say, living in Amer as an American, but perceived as an outsider. Um, so he's sort of caught between those two identities. Um, and, and it's an interesting way to, 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 to come back to that idea of perception and representation of self and the sort of internal versus external uh, perception, relating, relating back to what you were sharing early, earlier, Jocelyn, on that, on that note. Is there anything in the chat you want to share, Brianna, about that? Yeah, I, I'll just chime in here because I've been, I've been listening to, um, I've been listening to your conversation and thinking about the essential question and, you know, thinking about how, um, portraits can reveal these complex histories. Um, and I couldn't help but note one of the, um, one of the comments in the chat about the Ruth Asawa ID card um, is that this is um, a moment, right, um, within her life um, and is contrasted with the other two pieces, which are artworks, mm -hmm. um, whereas the ID card, right, is not. Um, and so we are not seeing a, a representation here of Ruth Asawa as an artist, as a sculptor. Um, and she created a very specific type of art that had a very specific type of message, right? Which I think, um, you know, layers on that complexity of, of her own history. Um, and I think that that's important with, with all three of these pieces, right? I mean, they're very much, um, you know, these singular moments um, within each of, um, you know, the artist's histories, if you will, um, that we're getting to take a peek at. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, and I think that um, absolutely, you know, this is not uh, Ruth Asawa's art. And, and I think I was thinking about that idea of reclaiming identity um, in, 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 in relation to this piece. And even the nature of, of having this ID card in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery and surfacing this story. Um, is almost an act of reclaiming in and of itself. The fact that we're talking about it and grappling with the complex history um, that it indicates, you know, is almost an act of sort of reclaiming and rethinking about that. Um, so it's really fascinating to think about that way. Right, that's right. And um, I mean, we know that Ruth Asawa's family gifted this ID card along with additional portraits of her to the museum, um, knowing that this this ID card would be um, viewed and um, discussed and, and taken apart in terms of um, reclaiming it as well.
Well, I think um, I just wanted to note um, one more connection between um, the three artists in that um, they both had, well, all three of them <laughs> had some experience of loss um, in regards to their identity. Um, Ruth Asawa, when their family, um, before they were incarcerated, had to destroy anything that had to do with Japan. Um, Hung Lu, when she was um, sent to the countryside, her family had to destroy anything that showed their um, educated in tech intellectual backgrounds. And then we have Shimamura's grandmother who most likely had to destroy things as well. Um, I'm actually quite curious how she ended up um, keeping her, her ink box. Um, so we, we do get that, that sense of um, the loss in terms of hiding their identity, but yet um, through it, we see that resilience as well. Well, I think we are just about out of time. I think we've um, certainly had a chance to take apart these layers of these portraits and um, talk a bit about just the complexity be behind um, the history of the nation at different points, as well as these uh, personal histories. Um, so we, want to thank you very much for joining us for this. Um, we hope you will join us next month on Thursday, December 9th for our next In Dialogue session. Um, the National Portrait Gallery will host it with the National Museum of the American Indian. And the question of why does accurate representation matter will be discussed and explored. Um, Ashley, if you could go to the final slide. And um, if you all have any questions or comments or thoughts afterwards, feel free to reach out to me or Carol. But in the meantime, thank you again for joining us and um, have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>